All right, well, I'm going to um, get us started. Nathan asked me earlier in the semester if I'd be interested in this, um, and if there was a particular section of Scripture I'd like to choose as a, a launching point for the discussion. And I chose um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, as kind of a launching point for this. It says, By faith we understand that the world, the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which were visible. And um, this verse is in the sometimes what's called the faith chapter in Hebrews um, chapter 11. And it very clearly states that it's by faith that we believe that God created. And um, I think that's always a good place to start off with the discussion of science and religion. Um, with the fact that we have a faith statement that's a very important faith statement right at the, at the core of our beliefs. But I think it's also important to recognize that everybody has a faith statement. We're not the only ones that have a faith statement. Um, just for um, the sake of the discussion, I've written up here two columns behind me. One labeled Christianity, the other philosophical naturalism. And on those two, I've written some statements that I would maintain are largely faith statements in that I cannot prove them. I can maybe find evidence for them um, that reinforces my statement of faith. But ultimately, they are, are, they are statements of faith. And I would like you to notice that even those that subscribe to philosophical naturalism, which you, would also, you could also call a form of atheism, they have statements of faith. So where I would say there is a God that exists that's real, they say there is not a God. There is no supernatural. Where I say that the universe was created by God, they say that the universe just is. It wasn't created. Um, neither one of us are able to prove definitively in any kind of scientific sense um, those statements. Um, where I say that man was created, but not just created, but created in the image of God, something I think is very important um, theologically, um, to a philosophical naturalist, man is just another organism, just like any other organism. Um, where I would maintain that God ultimately defines morality, right, wrong. Someone who subscribes to philosophical naturalism, it's really up to the individual or to the culture. Um, but man defines it. Um, but in every single one of these cases, I'm not sure that I could definitively provide a proof for any of those. They're statements of faith that we build our life on. And I think it's important to recognize that. And it should be fairly obvious that those two approaches, Christianity, philosophical naturalism, are incompatible. They don't, they cannot, um, you cannot hold both sets of beliefs at the same time. Um, but the question, and I think the question that we're supposed to deal with today is, how do these relate to science? And I think that's an important question in today's world. How do each one of these relate to science? Now what I have done up on the um, right side over here is written some characteristics of science. Science basically holds that the universe is orderly. It's understandable. Okay, It's possible to know the universe, to understand it. That is a basic principle of science. So the question becomes, how do each of these philosophies of life that we have, philosophical naturalism on the one hand, Christianity on the other, how do they relate to that statement? Um, in science, we say that explanations should be rational, logical. Again, we have to ask, how do these two views of life interact with that statement that we have in science, that approach to learning about the universe? In science, we say that explanations should be objective and empirical. We should base it on lots of data. Again, we have to ask the question, how do the, each of these worldviews relate to that? And finally, we say that explanations should be based on natural phenomena. And now let me explain that one for just a second. If I do an experiment, like uh, just recently we finished up an experiment looking at the effects of oxygen on the development of salamander larvae, baby salamanders. I can look at the results 
and conclude that the oxygen did something or the lack of oxygen did something to the development based on the experiment or I could also just conclude that well the oxygen really didn't do anything God did it and I could throw what we could call a God factor in there the problem when we do that is all of a sudden anything becomes possible because you can make any equation throw in the God, God factor and all of a sudden anything becomes possible and in science, we basically say we can't do that. We look for the natural law, the natural phenomena that would explain the results. Okay? And so we look for the natural um, explanation. Now again, we've got to ask the question, how does that relate to this philosophy of life that we'll call Christianity? How does it relate to the philosophy of life that we call philosophical naturalism? And that's where I think the discussion really needs to be. A lot of times in our popular culture, we see the debate appearing to be between science and Christianity. I think in reality, the debate that goes on in our culture is between philosophical naturalism and Christianity. And then both sides need to think about how do their philosophies of life interact with science. Um, but that tends to get lost because we've gotten sidetracked a little bit on what we're really arguing about. Um, so that's kind of the foundation I'd like to lay um, for this discussion, and then I think Dwayne has a few comments he'd like to make. I'm going to just say a few things uh, uh, from a historical perspective. I'm not going to take long, and then what we want to do is to sort of throw it open to you. And so as we go along, if you have something you'd like to contribute, question you'd like to raise, if you want to jot it down, or if you just want to remember it, that's all right. But if there were centuries, uh, for, for many, many centuries, no one really thought about there being any tension between the natural sciences and the Christian faith. Uh, it was only, of course, with the Age of Enlightenment, as we call it, uh, and sciences from the sciences began uh, to uh, to develop um, centuries ago. That uh, tensions came up. I guess probably in the first one of the first areas would be in the subject of astronomy. Um, was the sun at the center of the socialist the social system, or was it uh, was it the earth? And uh, what are the implications of that? You see, theologians argued not on the basis of science, but on the basis of theology, that God would not take his most beloved creature, humankind, and put him on a planet that was somehow stuck out here on the side of some solar system. It was argued theologically that since man was the center of God's creation, that the earth was the center of all that there was in the universe. And so when uh, uh, Galileo and others began to argue otherwise, then of course it caused some conflict. And as you know, there have been conflicts like this that have taken place along through uh, the centuries. And in case after case, it has been religion that has come out on the short end of that dispute. You see, I think that there is a kind of uh, built-in uh, tension between the natural sciences and any kind of religious faith, including our faith in Christianity, a kind of built-in tension. Because the sciences take as their sphere of interest all that is. I don't think that a real scientist would say that there is anything that is of no concern to us. And you might say, well, what about such a thing as love? Is that of concern to the science? Or, or we could talk about other kinds of emotional uh, things, origins, that's certainly in the realm of interest of science. But if I were to say such a thing as love, I had a class set many years ago now but from a man who is a neurosurgeon and a PhD in psychology. And he, uh, um, he talked about this thing of love. He said, well, we can, in fact, do some quantifying of it. 
you see. We can put it in some numbers. He said, for example, we can put a mother rat in the middle of a cage and put her young on one side and put some food on the other side. And we can measure how many times she goes across an electric grid to her young and how many times she'll go across to get her food. So we can begin to quantify something. I'm not sure if we should associate the love of a rat with uh, human beings and their love for their children or not. But you see, I'm just illustrating the point that if we want to take such an abstraction as love, there will be somebody who will want to quantify it in some way that they will want to do that. And if you quantify something, you're getting in the realm of the sciences. Uh, Dr. Mackey in the sciences wants to talk about the hard sciences and the social sciences and say he doesn't think he doesn't he thinks we ought to just talk about the natural sciences. But if we're if we're just if we're going to uh, talk about um, uh, quantifying uh, information, then then I, I think uh, we could find a scientist somewhere who would call himself a scientist. Even and that would be a realm of some argument um, that uh, would take any realm of human interest. We would say that's our whole realm. Well, again, religion. We're interested in the whole shebang, aren't we? Now you might say, as a person of faith, I'm not really interested in how electrons move along through uh, copper wire and bring electricity in this room. That's not matter a matter of my religious faith. But as a matter of fact, there have been volumes and volumes written on this world being a place of order because God has made it a place of order. You can talk about the God factor if you like. But I suppose, Nathan, as long as we're around, you know that there are going to be some areas, at least, if there's going to be science, there has to be some areas where at least we're investigating, where there are questions. And um, um, so the, uh, if you want to talk about uh, uh, electrons moving through a copper wire, um, that might be taken as evidence of some, some kind of statement about the nature of our God. And so, um, there, I think there's a kind of built-in tension there that is... And then when you factor in the way that science goes about, as you've just indicated, science goes about reaching its conclusions, and the way people of faith go about reaching their conclusions, there's bound to be tension. And there is, of course, and, uh, and will be. Uh, I, I, I believe in a universe, and so I believe that there is room in it for us to believe in God if He is true, and I believe He is. And at the same time, there is room for all of our human endeavors to understand this natural world. And uh, um, so, with that, uh, what, what you have, uh, we will look for your report. Feedback questions. And Nathan, you can take a whip and, uh, <laughs> if they don't. Can I ask the first question? Yeah. Absolutely. Can a scientist do science without a presupposition like Christianity or philosophical naturalism? And is that a good or a bad thing to try to do it without presuppositions? If there's going to be presuppositions in science, even about just the, the idea that we can understand the universe, I mean, when you look at some of those, those really are, in a way, presuppositional statements. Um, then the question becomes, how do they relate to those, those other two? Um, in my experience, if I go and do a research project and somebody like Richard Dawkins goes and does a research project, we're going to use similar methodologies. We're going to follow similar patterns of logic. We're probably going to come to similar conclusions looking at the way the natural world works. Um, I have yet to see a case where two people working side by side on a project come to radically different conclusions based on this. Um, you know, actually working with real experiments and, and data and all of that, you just really don't see it. Um, and one of the things that I th is a, really a myth, I, I think, in our culture is that there aren't Christians in science. Um, 
it's, it's a, a little over a decade old now, but the most recent um, study I saw in science um, showed that 40% of scientists believe in God. That's less than the rest of the population, but it's still a substantial number that believe in God. And um, I can't tell that in the way that we approach the science in how we do it, that we do it any differently from those who don't believe in God. Now, there is a difference in how we respond to it, but that's not what shows up in the literature. There's a difference in the way we respond to it and that in everything I do, when I get done, I look at, man, isn't God incredible? It doesn't matter that I have explained how it happens through natural law. God is still ultimately the creator, the one who made it possible, all of that. So I see God in it whether I can explain it or not explain it. It doesn't matter. Um, to me, I see God. I see the fingerprint of Him. The person that doesn't believe in God, man, isn't it incredible that this happened and, well, all the laws of nature were just right so it could happen. You know, it, I, I, I don't know. How, they, they get a different response to it. But that's not the response that you see when you get into the scientific literature because that's generally considered to be a response that's outside of science. Um, so there's a little bit of a myth that there aren't, um, aren't Christians out there. Um, there is a major uh, a professor that I know that um, really a big researcher, um, nationally known, um, actually internationally known, and uh, he signs the bottom of every email, lost but for the grace of God. Every email that he sends out, he's the editor of journals, and he sends out requests for people to review journals, and at the bottom of those emails it says, lost but for the grace of God. It's there. Um, there's another guy that has a statement at the bottom of his email. Um, I can't quote it exactly, but those who reject faith on the basis of science and those who reject science on the basis of faith are equally benighted. Basically saying they're both equally in the dark. Um, but you have a guy there that has a faith in something beyond just the natural world. Um, and I could give you lots of other examples. I got an email from a colleague the other day saying, hey, could you pray for us? You know, this is a guy at a secular school. Um, so there, there are definitely people out there um, that, that, that work in the field. I think where you see the difference is how we respond when we're talking among ourselves. Man, isn't God incredible with that creation? But you don't see that in the literature. So, does that answer your question? I, I, I'd say, uh, Nathan, that there isn't anything, anywhere, anybody, anybody can do without presuppositions. Mm -hmm. You've got to bring something to the table no matter what. And, uh, if you, you know, um, when it comes to the approach uh, that science makes in to, to questions, to its data, its confession, if I can use that. Um, by its nature, religion calls for commitment. I can't be detached when I look at the way the Bible speaks. I can't speak of Jesus dying on the cross it's just a historical incident that happened in time. Science, by its nature, calls for detachment. It's just as you said, Nathan. It, it may be you or Richard Dawkins. You, you know the, the. But because both of you come to the data with some degree of detachment, you come up with similar answers. Religion, by its nature, calls for involvement. And. Um, so the presuppositions, I, I, I think talking to people of science, I, particularly Richard Dawkins, since you mentioned the yeah. name. Yeah, he's, he's a I mean, lightning rod. So. If, if you want to talk about <laughs> commitment, to bring in commitment, he brings it to the whole thing. I mean, his faith, he drives down our throat yeah. with all of the passion. <coughs> 
that Oral Roberts does. Yeah. Well, and he, I think the thing on him, he holds to this view very, very strongly. But if you think about the difference in how we respond to science between the two views, he believes that there is no God, all there is is the natural world, and science has been shown over and over to be a very effective way to learn about the natural world. And for him, science is the way to know about the universe. There is no real other way to objectively learn about the universe or to learn anything, really. And so for him, science is the only way to go. That's it. And you can't reject something from science because it's how you know the natural world. For me as a Christian, the natural world is huge. It's incredible. And I investigate it with science, but the science is limited because science can only investigate that natural world and it is incapable of investigating the spiritual world and getting anything particularly useful out of it. It's not capable of it. And that's not a limitation on God. That's a limitation on science. It's a Science is a human enterprise. We are finite, limited beings. There are things that we cannot do. Um, we don't know how to do. And I think science is very limited. And I think we make a mistake when we try to force God to fit into our small, little, investigative methodology called science. Um, I think that's a mistake. Um, but if you think about that, that's going to cause us to respond very differently to scientific data. I'm responding to something that is brought about by science which I view as limited. Dawkins is responding to something brought about by science that he views as the one way of knowing. And that right there results in drastically different responses um, to what is what is found. And science becomes a religion almost when it is the way to know. Which is not such a bad thing. I mean, it's a different it's a different religion. I, I guess what I mean when I when I say it's not such a bad thing is that we, we know what we're dealing with. You know, if, if it's like you said, when we have philosophical naturalism and Christianity, then we're dealing with two faith systems, and and we can we can deal with that. But but sometimes, and Dawkins is probably one. Uh, but uh, but sometimes, people of science can assert things about their discipline and want it to be under the rubric science when it really comes under the rubric philosophy. Sure. Absolutely. Who else? Um, in order to be the proverbial Renaissance man, must one compartmentalize different fields that they go to with philosophy and science? And, um, if there's a way to integrate them, how does one go about doing that? You want to take one? Well, the, the, the first part of it is just that science, I view, is very limited. Now, there are going to be times when it butts up against religion, and religion butts up against it. There's no, there is no way around that. Um, but I do view science as very, very limited. Um, and so I, I feel more as complementary rather than as, as adversaries. Um, I think that a complementary approach um, where they ask different types of questions is, is, is better, but it still doesn't solve everything. Um, you know, evolution is a case in point. Um, you know, it's a, a hot button topic in today's culture um, where there's religious interpretation, there's interpretation of the data from science, and they're appearing to butt up against each other. What do we do with that? Um, you can deal with um, moral issues relating to reproduction, um, stem cell research, things like that, and there's going to be some tension, potentially, 
um, that that shows up, and you could go down the list. And so you can't treat them as you can't completely compartmentalize them and be successful. I don't think, or at least it's not going to be a very fulfilling way to live life. Um, what I believe religiously informs every part of my life. Science informs a major portion of my life too, but it's limited. I'm in complete agreement that that the. I, I want to be. I mentioned believing in a universe. Um, I I think that religion has to speak across disciplines. Our faith must speak across disciplines. Um, you, you know, short historical perspective. I think they there was a time toward the end of the 1800s, in the early 1900s. When the old classic liberal theologians um, who contributed incidentally a great deal of biblical studies, I, I don't want to, but the old classical liberal theologians said, well, you know, we religious people are losing on so many fronts here. Let's take the Bible from a scientific standpoint. And there are, if you went back into that period of time, I, I could stack up the books here on religion, on biblical interpretation that would have the word science in them. Um, more conservative people became more, uh, were very concerned about Christian evidences. And there were, of course, volumes and volumes written about that. But then there came a period, and I'm talking about the larger religious world. There came a period when, uh, when what is, I, I hesitate to use these technical terms like neo-orthodoxy, but in the 1930s, when there came in a way of thinking where, um, on religious matters, let's leave the sciences alone. Let's affirm our faith and just get out of the sciences. And there was a, a radical kind of separation. So if you go back, to, say, to the 1930s, there is a period for decades where there is nothing written, virtually nothing written about Christian evidences or about science and religion. It went that way for a generation or two. And then there's a kind of change in the philosophical movement. And in recent years, there has been a wealth of books on the intersection of science and faith. I think that's a helpful thing. And uh, I, I, I'm glad to stay, I'm glad that there are people trying to think through the processes. But uh, but I, if I'm understanding where you're coming from with the question, I, uh, I'm in full agreement that in our faith, we need to be afraid of looking in no direction and that we want to incorporate uh, as much of the information and the challenges of our world as we can within uh, the circle of our faith. And did we get anywhere high low near what you were asking? You know, when you, I really believe that when I look at creation, it's through the eyes of faith, but when I look at it, I see God 
all over the place. I really do. I see God there, um, or at least His handiwork would maybe be a better way to say that. Um, now, there are definitely things where it's not God, where you've got evil in the world that God has allowed to exist for, for a time. But ultimately, I see a world where God is the one who is in control. Um, that shapes the way I respond to the data. And if it doesn't shape the way I respond as an individual, I would maintain that there's a little bit of a problem there um, because it does inform my life. Um, I, it, within the sciences, you know, the way I do the science, it doesn't change that much. Um, and I would actually maintain that trying to incorporate it in too much into the sciences is not a good thing from both a religious perspective and a scientific perspective. Um, if I try to put God in every place I don't understand something, or I need a little bit of extra you know, wiggle room to make something work, if I put God in there, I think I essentially end up with a God of the gaps, where I use God to fill in what I don't know. But if I know it, it's not God that did it. It's the natural law. And what happens is as we learn more and more about the natural universe, our God can get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I don't think that's a good thing. I, I, because I think our God is way too big to be put in that kind of a box. On the scientific perspective, putting God in to explain the things we don't understand has the potential to short circuit our science where we don't investigate something. Well, God did it, and then we don't investigate it. Um, you know, there was a time when life itself was the ultimate evidence of God because we had no explanation for how life happened. And then we discovered the cells and we discovered the, you know, proteins and DNA and how they all work and how genetic information is passed on, all of that. And now we've got a lot more of an explanation um, for that. Well, that was almost devastating to some religious people at that time. And that was part of the reason Darwin's book was, was so devastating to a lot of people was because all of a sudden there was an explanation for something that God was the explanation for that. And they had, they had, they had kind of limited God down. And I think that's a mistake in the way that we, we think about things. Um, I, so I don't think um, trying to put God into the, into the actual process there in some kind of formal way helps either religion or science, either one. But that's a reflection of the nature of our ability to work and do a very man made process, really. We have about five minutes left. I was wondering, a little crossfire, <clears throat> in a good way, if uh, Nathan is a, is a biologist, if you're going to talk to a room full of people in biblical studies, what would be the one thing you'd want them to know that would be helpful? In other words, don't teach your students this because it ruins them to come to my classroom. And as a, th as a theologian, <laughs> uh, Dwayne, what's the one thing you'd want to say to a room full of biologists? Say, here's what we need to understand about theology, about the Bible. What would be, what's that message that needs to cross over the disciplines? The main thing I would tell Bible faculty is make sure you know what evolution is. Um, there was a, a teacher, I won't name him, a wonderful guy, I like him, but somebody asked him what evolution was and he said, well, it's like when a tadpole turns into a frog. That's development. Um, What's evolution? Um, you know, and I think when a Bible faculty member or a Bible teacher gets up and starts trying to say something about evolution and they don't know what it is, that's a dangerous thing. I think that if you want to, you know, if a Bible faculty member wants to address the topic, make sure you know what it is. That's not going to be easy because it's a tough topic. Does that answer your question? I, I think I would say um, uh, to the to the science faculty, I hope that you will make it clear to your students that in the scientific disciplines there comes a point where you are operating on faith. That. Let's not 
let's not arrange two categories here where Christians sort of blindly believe and the people of science want information. That's what I think. Let's, let's both recognize that we have our presuppositions that we're offering. Very good. Let's show them our appreciation.